good Sunday morning, everybody. I promise you I'm not trying to play favorite on this side of the congregation this morning. We're just uh, trying to readjust for the screen. So, <laughs> hope everybody's having a good weekend so far. As I said this morning, it was a beautiful morning and day yesterday. And we'll continue to have blessings as we congregate together and praise our Heavenly Father. You know, let's start with prayer this morning. Dick, will you lead some prayer, please? Father, we just thank you for the ability we have to come together and worship you and fellowship and encourage one another, Father. We're so thankful for Jesus. We just ask you to be with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dick. And Brother David, would you mind to see if that screen's going to be okay and how we're looking over there? We had to readjust a little bit this morning. We got to make sure it's good. Oh, no, no. You're good. You're good. All right. Let's start with 668. Our God, he is alive. time and welcome all the guests that are all here this morning let's see number two so we're going to go back to the front of the red book close to it number two we are marching to zion and if you'd like to stand please stand because it's kind of hard to sit and march at the same time marching to zion page number two Beautiful. 
Steve, you may be seated. Please turn to 299. 299. Lead me to Calvary. song this morning will be All Lord God. All Lord God.
together with cords that cannot be broken. this morning and taking the Lord's Supper together. Let's sing Create in Me a Clean Heart. something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to come up and just get your your cup and the loaf and go back to your seat and we'll all participate together. A uh, couple things here that I thought about here lately, but have you ever thought, what would I be like as a person without Jesus? You ever think about that? Would I still be the same as I am today? And today, am I the same as when I first became a Christian? Uh, hopefully that last question is no, because 
prayerfully and as we've grown that there's a lot of changes taking place. As the years have passed and we've grown in our walk with the Lord, we have to look at all the changes that have transpired. I just listed a few and this list could go on and on. As Christians, as we study, we grow and we learn and get closer to the Lord. We've learned about forgiveness and to love others. Uh, we have more patience with others. We have more compassion. We've acquired a sense of personal peace. We've learned how great God's blessings are. And we've learned to accept God's answers to our prayers in his time. Uh, that's a lot difficult thing for a lot of us because we we pray and we want to get God to give us the answer we want instantly. Sometimes it takes a little time for that to get worked out. You know, we know that Christians... We still stumble, we make mistakes, but we also know that if we're faithful and repentant, God lifts us up, forgives us, and gives us a fresh new start. And uh, so many times we stumble, we regret it, we wish we hadn't, but if we repent and ask the Lord, he'll forgive us and we get to start new. We would not have the promise of rejoicing with the Lord in heaven, no troubles, no pain, nor suffering. If Jesus had not died on the cross for our sins and provided the path for our salvation, he shed his blood in agony because he loved us. And that love has never changed. And consistently in the scripture, he pleads with us to, to come and follow him. And he didn't ask us, he told us to partake of these emblems on each the first day of the week when we come together to remember him and never forget the gift that he's made available to us. Uh, I was thinking too the other day and and uh, sometimes I think about, you know, in giving, usually in giving, and this is not about the giving, but I've just been thinking about this, that we think about giving our money. But I think what God gave us, you know, when he died on that cross, to me it's like he opened a treasure chest. And all the gifts, all the things that he's given us and we've been blessed with, and uh, we've heard before uh, comments have been made. You ever just sit down and keep a journal kind of all the ways God's blessed us, the things he's given us? And uh, sometimes, and I've probably mentioned this before, but it seems like we have to get off of white here before we really begin to understand and realize the blessings we've had in our life. So with that, uh, we'll have a prayer, and then we'll partake. Father, we're so grateful that we can be here this morning around this table. And mostly, Father, we just want to thank you for giving your son to us and that he had the courage to die for us in our stead. And Father, we realize that without him in our life, it would be impossible for us to have peace. We have no promise of eternal life. And we just, once again, Father, we just thank you for blessing us with these remembrances that we don't ever forget. Just be with us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and come up ahead.
Matthew 26 says, And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, after a blessing, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take heed, this is my body. And when he, had, when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Cheerful giver. It's read in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. I got the verse from the NLT version. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. How many people enjoy giving gifts? Raise your hand. All right. We have Christmas. We have birthdays, we got Valentine's Day, we have Easter next Sunday. To me, it's Resurrection Sunday. And when kids get their Easter baskets, the point is that it is a special thing when someone goes out of their way to get something that you would enjoy and they present it to you as a gift. It brings back memories right now. When we were kids, we went to Muriel's house every Easter. <laughs> After lunch, she would feed us lunch, and we would have an Easter hunt. And those are the memories that we will never forget with you, Murrow. I appreciate that. Giving is an exciting and a fun way of letting someone know that you care about them. Now, how would it feel if someone came up to you and gave you a gift, but they had a scowl on her face, you know? They made it just plain obvious that they did not want to give you that gift, but that someone made them give them that gift. They may even grab a hold of that thing so tight you can't pry it out of their hands. Now, is that truly given? No. A gift comes from the heart. So let us, each one, give us his purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or necessity for God who loves a cheerful giver. So what the Apostle Paul was saying there to the church at Corinth was that God loves a cheerful giver, a happy giver. That we should give gifts to God because we love Christ and because he deserves them. And guess what? In 2 Corinthians 9.10 the Spirit by the Apostle Paul says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources, then produce a great harvest of generosity. So God will bless us when we sow with a cheerful heart. He says right there, he will multiply and increase what an honor to be able to sow cheerfully into the Lord's kingdom and for him. To bless us financially in return. Please stand as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I am very thankful for this church. We have such a loving church for many years. We thank you for the great gifts that you provide us. May we continue to be strong as a church and give unto you when we can with a cheerful heart. Let us love for what we do for you. Bless the remaining of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus and he says, old man has to walk farther, huh? I started hitting up here, I guess. <laughs> okay, we're Janet today. Not feeling well? Her back was really bothering her. She needs a big time prayers today. Okay, we need to pray for Janet. She's having problems with her back. And how's the four year old boy doing? He's hanging in there, and they'll be making a lot of trips. Wednesday for the next couple of years. Um, he has 90%, 95% recovery rate, which is good. So we need to continue to pray for him and his family at this time. Okay. That's, <clears throat> that's uh, Paul, the one who has leukemia we're talking about. And Grayson, Susie's great grandchild, Gand the child, G A N D, it's an H E R E. For safe delivery and continue to pray for Wilma. Tom Asher, pray for him to get in an interview with the Oregon State Department. Matthew's an older man today. 53. 63? 50. Oh. <laughs> And Tom goes into Friday for surgery. And Norma is going to have a biopsy. I did last Tuesday. I haven't gotten any results. Oh, okay. Tessa needs prayer. And Lawrence, I guess he's fighting with the insurance company now. He's taking money away from him for his diabetes. So. Uh, Susie's daughter, Heather, had surgery. Okay, Dean Pierce needs prayer. And Brinley, is it Brinley or Brinley? Brinley. Brinley. Yeah. Susie's grandkid needs prayer. Uh, better and is gaining weight. Stockmans are doing better. And we need prayer for their son. Jack, Vicky, Jack and Vicky, Susie's uh, friends, need prayer. Doris Allen, Janet's friend, husband, and Dave Bell, Randy Kellogg, <coughs> and Louis Lawrence and all are in need of prayer. And Susie's brother Joe is doing better. You get a reserve any results on your trip to Eugene, Dave? Yeah, I got pretty good pretty good for that. Good. Yes. Um, this is for Tessa is on the prayer thing. The last time she was here she mentioned possibly having cancer on her thyroid. Well there's a craze. Um, they don't think it's cancer and it's something that they can just watch instead of operating on. So Great. Ten o'clock on Wednesdays. Ladies' choir practice. Five o'clock on Sundays. And you're going to sing inspiration tonight. Anything else? Please sign up if you like to sing a special. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Would you have a? Hey, it's not good. Charity Olson. Oh.
Now here you had to have it. Yeah, I'm praise. Uh, my daughter got a job in Boise, Idaho, and she'll be moving there Easter this year. And I got a picture of her and her grand and her daughter. And I'll show you later. I don't want to pass my phone on you. After church, I'll show you a picture. Of <coughs> yes, Gary. Uh, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Good to see you back, Marty. Anybody else? Let's pray. Dear God, I ask that you be with all of those that are on our cancer and chronic illness list, as well as the ones that I mentioned on our prayer list. Be with the ones that are fighting this virus, and <clears throat> thank God I'm going to go down this, this afternoon, and Jenny and I will get our second shot for the virus, the vaccine. Pray to you and all of us, in God's name, amen. There's no music. This morning, we just need continued prayer for our ladies that are not here, Sherry, Mom, and some others. So, <laughs> and with uh, Resurrection Sunday being next Sunday, Jerry and I are going to sing 155 in Red Book. 155 Christ arose.
Good morning. Good morning. Does anyone know what today is? Palm Sunday. Yeah, Palm Sunday. So I'm going to give you a Palm Sunday sermon. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the 21st chapter, Matthew 21. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for all that you came to do. And uh, Lord, we just pray as we study your word that you would encourage us and uh, help us to live better lives according to your will. Just pray that uh, you would teach us this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mountain of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what, the pro what was spoken through the prophet, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of the donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their, their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very loud, large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, history is full of all kind of uh, grand entrances. This is also referred to as the triumphal entry. <coughs> and this phrase, uh, triumphal entry, uh, comes from a Roman practice. When a Roman general had conquered a nation, which would expand the, uh, the Roman Empire and increase its power, uh, they would give that general a triumph. And what that meant was that they would come into Rome, and it was all carefully orchestrated and carried out, and it was a very significant event. It was a very joyous occasion for Rome. And the general, he would ride out in front of his army on a stallion, and his army of men would follow, and behind them, uh, the captives, who were all tied up, they would follow them, and then behind the captives would be all the spoils of war. All this was on display for, for everyone to see. And when the, when the general came in, the people, they would shout, and they would bow, and they would wave, kind of like, like a ticker tape parade, or like a, a king or queen that's, that's being, you know, inaugurated into the royal status. There's all this pomp and all this splendor and majesty associated with these kinds of events. And um, then they're usually, you know, presented with a, with a scepter, and a robe and a, and a crown. And it was a joyous time of celebration where everyone turns up to be a part of it, uh, to be part of uh, such a joyous occasion. Well, this is sort of what's taking place here with Jesus' triumphal entry. For a brief moment, where we're given a glimpse of the honor and the royalty that Jesus deserved. You know, 
for the briefest of moments, the, the crowds, you know, they're acknowledging their, their king and their messiah. And they give him the praise and the honor that he deserved. And notice, uh, uh, Jesus initiates this whole thing. He, he sets it all into motion. He instructs the two disciples to go into this village and they're going to find a donkey there with, with her colt. And how did he know that? Because he's omniscient. He knew of the animals. He knew the people that lived there. And he knew how they were going to respond. And Jesus tells them what to say. That they are to say that the Lord has need of it. And that they would be ready and they would be willing to, to serve him whatever his need might be. You know, and it was very rare that Jesus asked for anything. You know, he came into this world with nothing. Um, he was born not in a palace, but, but in a stable. His parents were extremely poor. Um, and uh, after he grew up, he began his ministry, and basically he was homeless. Once he said to a would-be follower, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So, you know, he spent most of his nights out under the stars. He was always giving things to others. You know, whether it was multiplying the food so the people could eat, or giving somebody hope, or healing their bodies, or healing their souls, or giving them life by bringing them back from the dead. <clears throat> or giving them life through his words as, as he preached the gospel. He was always giving. He was never asking, you know, from anybody. But in this instance, you know, he, he needs something. And they gave it to him immediately as, a, as an offering, you know. Uh, they were willing to help and serve the Lord. And, and likewise, you know, our attitude should resemble theirs, that whoever these people were, that, you know, if the Lord has need of it, whatever the Lord needs, you know, that we would respond in that same way, that we'd be ready and willing to give anything uh, in service to the Lord. Now, uh, Mark and Luke, they point out to us that, that the colt had never been ridden on. Is that important? I think so, because it was an honor to ride on an animal that had never been ridden. Much like his tomb. It talks about the tomb that he was buried in, that it was a new tomb that no one had ever been buried there before. Well, this coal had been saved for the Lord Jesus. It was saved for this one rider, the humble yet glorious King Jesus. But Jesus, he's, he's setting all these events in motion because there is symbolism in all this. And there's a certain timing of all the things that were going to happen that week. This was the last week of his life. And as Jesus would ride into Jerusalem that day, several important things were happening. Uh, as John the Baptist prophesied back in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus was the sacrificial Lamb who was going to take away the sins of the world. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, the Jews, they were selecting their sacrificial lambs for Passover. As a Jew, you would select a lamb, and then you would take it in to your home and treat it kind of like a pet. And then later that week, it would be sacrificed. And as Jesus the Lamb rode into Jerusalem, the people received him, and they chose him as their Messiah and King. And then later that week, he would die as all the other sacrificial lambs were put to death. So Jesus was putting all of this in motion. He, he was selected as the lamb to die, to take away the sins of the world, and he would die on Passover as all the other lambs were killed. 
But he was in control of everything. God had everything planned out to the day and the hour that these prophecies were fulfilled. So the disciples, they bring these two animals and they have to bring the mother along to, to keep the colt uh, calm. And so uh, as they would lead the mother, you know, the, the, coat, the colt would follow. And so they make this, this saddle for Jesus by placing their coats on its back. And Luke talks about Jesus coming over the ridge of the, of the Mount of Olives and heading down into the Kidron Valley that approaches Jerusalem. Now, the Mount of Olives is 2,600 feet high, and it, it's a great location. I've been there. It's a great location to just take in the whole city of Jerusalem. And so as they head over this ridge and as they head down uh, towards the city, the crowds, they begin to multiply all around him. And Matthew says that all this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of the donkey. And the prophet that Matthew speaks of is Zechariah. And uh, it is found in Zechariah, the ninth chapter and the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now normally uh, a king would come riding on a stallion with an, with an army behind him, as, as we talked about earlier. But this was not the way that Jesus came. He came gentle or meek, riding on a donkey as a symbol of humility. The prophet Zechariah, he speaks of him first as being righteous. Now Jesus himself was righteous, and he would establish righteousness uh, or justice. In uh, Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, it speaks of Jesus as the righteous one who would bring forth righteousness. Isaiah says, look at my servant whom I strengthened. He is my chosen one and I am pleased with him. I put my spirit upon him and he will reveal justice to the nations. He will be gentle. He will not shout or raise his voice in the streets. He will not crush those who are weak or quench the smallest hope. He will bring full justice to all who have been wronged. He will not stop until truth and righteousness prevail throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. So this, this prophecy of Jesus shows his gentleness to, to the broken and the weak, but it also states that he is righteous and that he is going to establish righteousness. Um, now, Scripture points out that none of us are righteous, no, not one. And that's why Jesus had to come to be the second Adam, the only one who could walk in perfect righteousness, the only one who could establish righteousness. So he's going to bring full justice to all those who have been wronged, and he'll not stop until truth and righteousness prevail throughout the earth. Jesus is the righteous one, and he was able to, to die our death, and he's going to right all wrongs on that great and glorious judgment day. His righteousness and truth will indeed prevail. And then Zechariah says, he comes to you having salvation. Literally, the Hebrew says, showing himself a savior. Now, Jesus came to be our savior. In fact, the name Jesus means savior. He came to save us from our sins. He came to save us from our guilt, to save us from our shame, to save us from death, to save us from the devil, to save us from our eternal lostness. 
to save us in order that we might live with him forever in eternal bliss. And then Zechariah says, he came in humility riding on a donkey. Jesus didn't present himself as, as a military leader coming triumphantly on a white stallion with, with a sword in his hand followed by a great army, but he presented himself in humility to be a sin offering and to bring peace. And this is symbolized in the donkey. A donkey was what was referred to as a beast of burden. It was an animal uh, that was set aside to carry heavy loads. In fact, the Hebrew word donkey literally means an animal under the yoke. An animal that is under the will of its master. So the donkey carries the burdens of man. You know, what a better analogy could there be of this than Jesus who came to carry our burdens, to carry them upon himself. Christ carried the weight of all of our sins. He bore them in his flesh. God laid on him our guilt and our shame. He laid on him uh, the wrath for all of our wickedness. And he suffered bearing that load. But he willingly bore those burdens and uh, they were laid on him for, for our sakes. Isaiah says that he carried our sorrows and he was crushed for our iniquities. For he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. So Zechariah says, rejoice greatly. And uh, we, when this prophecy came true, you know, that the crowds did rejoice greatly, didn't they? Although um, they didn't understand, you know, the, the implications of it all. But for a brief moment, they did rejoice and they did glorify and honor uh, his name, you know, the way that Jesus' name should be honored. And so as he was riding along, one of the first things they did to show their honor was by spreading their cloaks on the road before him. Now, what did that mean, you know, when they laid their cloaks down on the road for him to walk on? Well, you can get uh, some insight uh, of this from 2 Kings, the ninth chapter and verse 12, where it says, Jehu said, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. And they hurried and they took their cloaks and they spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew their trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So as soon as his men realized that Jehu had been made king, they took off their cloaks and they spread them out underneath him. In other words, saying, I am under you now. I am putting myself under your submission, under your authority. I'm putting myself underneath your feet. Now, thrones were always elevated in the ancient times. And you always had to be lower than the king when you approached the king. So by putting their, their robes on the ground before him, they were saying that we, we place ourselves underneath your feet, under your authority. Ephesians chapter 1 says, He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. And that's what's going on in the, in the triumphal entry. They're, they're acknowledging him as, the, as their king, their Messiah, they're putting themselves underneath his authority by placing their cloaks on the road before him. And there, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time. There were different festivals, you know, that you are expected to attend in Jerusalem. But if you could only attend one, Passover was the one that you wanted to be uh, present for. 
It was a remembrance of the redemption from Israel and the blood of the lamb that, you know, that had protected them from their death. Uh, Josephus records a census that was taken around the time of Christ. And in that census, it states that 256,000 lambs were sacrificed that year. Uh, and one lamb was usually sacrificed for about every 10 people. So there may have been around 200, uh, two and a half million people in swarming around Jerusalem at this time during Passover. So there were multitudes around Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem that day. And this event is recorded by all four Gospels. So you know it was something significant. They all felt that, you know, it needed to be a part of their records. All four give insight also as to what the people were shouting as Jesus rode in on the donkey. Now, Luke states that they said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you come in the name of the Lord, you're coming with his full authority. Blessed is God's king. They honor him and they praise him as the one coming with authority and the power of God. And they're borrowing language from the Psalms, specifically Psalm 118. It's called the Conqueror Psalm or the Psalm of, of Salvation. But they believe that this was their Messiah. And they were right, but... They had a different expectation for their Messiah. The Messiah that they had created in their minds. Now, Matthew adds that they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. And when they said that, they were referring to 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises David a son who will reign on this eternal throne in an eternal kingdom. So they called Jesus this son of David, which he was. And the word Hosanna, that means save now. They wanted the son of David to save them, which he would do, but not in the way that they were expecting. They wanted salvation from the Romans. That's what they wanted salvation from. Um, So just that week, you know, that week of the Passover, it was celebrating an important event. The Passover was celebrating the freedom that the Israelites were received from their bondage and slavery in Egypt, right? So that's what they were celebrating that whole week. That's what was on their minds. So what they're thinking is, let's have another, you know, uh, Redemption, not from Egypt this time, but from the Roman Empire. So they were expecting and hoping that Jesus would come and bring them salvation from their bondage under Rome. But Jesus came to do something much greater than that, didn't he? He was going to deliver them from bondage like he did in Egypt because that was a picture of what Jesus would come to do. But the freedom from bondage that he was offering was much greater than just being delivered from Rome. It was, he was going to free them from their bondage of sin, from their bondage of death and the devil. He came to liberate them from such a greater enemy than they were ever anticipating. But they were right to call him the son of David. They were right to shout, Hosanna! Save us, son of David. Mark adds that they shouted, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Luke adds they shouted, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now what does that remind you of? It reminds us of the angels, right? The angels that proclaimed at Jesus' birth, 
glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angels praised God that day for what God came to do through the birth of his son. And the crowds, they were praising God this day for sending Jesus, their Messiah and King, who would bring salvation. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You could always count on the Pharisees to put a damper on everything. Uh, they refused to worship him, and they couldn't stand for anyone else to worship him either. But Jesus says to them, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You know, Jesus deserves to be worshipped by all of his creation. And you know, this is his moment. This is Jesus' moment right here. And he's going to have it. And if men were not going to give him the glory and the honor that he deserved in this moment, or if someone tried to put a stop to it, even that wouldn't be enough to kill this moment because at that point the stones would cry out on his behalf and sing their praises. Now if you know anything about Israel, you know there's a lot of stones in Israel. So that would have made a pretty good choir if it came to that. But men were doing their job for once that day and scripture says, that that is why we were created, to bring God glory. The account also says that they took palm branches from the trees and they spread them out on the road as well. So, so palm branches, they were a symbol of, of victory and salvation and joy. And the crowds... You know, they had seen everything that Jesus had sent and done up to this point. And they were excited. And, and the palm branches, they were part of that, of that celebration. Do you know where else we see people waving palm branches? In heaven. In John, uh, the seventh chapter, it says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing right robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom and thanks and honor, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We're still going to be waving palm branches and praising God about salvation in heaven. Uh, most of our hymns have to do with Praising God over our salvation, don't they? And like I said earlier, that's what we were created for. In Isaiah, the 43rd chapter and verse 7, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. And verse 21 reiterates this, and it says, The people I have formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And all of creation was made to bring him, to bring him glory. Listen to Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For at his command they were created and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures, and all of ocean's depths, lightning and hail, and snow and clouds, 
stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all you hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel. The people close to his heart praise the Lord. And the very last words of the Psalms, Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. All things were created to, to praise him. And in closing, I want to read another text from Revelation, which again shows all living things praising Jesus and giving him glory. And the song that they sing is a song about the one who was slain to bring about salvation. It's in the fifth chapter of Revelation, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And each one had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God men from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them into a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for this glimpse of just seeing the appropriate worship and praise that was due to Jesus. He endured a lot through his life especially on the cross, but in this moment, on Palm Sunday as he came in on the donkey, men shouted his name and praised him and gave him the glory and honor that was due his name. And uh, now he sits on the throne at your right hand. And Lord, help us to just every day have this kind of praise and worship in our hearts. You have created us, you said, for your glory, so that we would worship you. So Lord, help us to every day to worship you and to give you the honor and the praise that is due. We love you and we thank you and we pray in Christ's name. Please stand as we sing Praise Him, Praise Him, page 11 in the red book. Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus our 
Sings grace tonight. Please sign up. Please sign up. This will, it will not be recorded, so you don't have to worry about that. But please sign up and let's praise God this evening. Let's sing every day with Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day.